tonight, given the holidays. And so uh, I'm Dave Bugney, a board member of the Clackamas River Basin Council. And uh, I'm excited to be here tonight. And joining me tonight is Liz Gilliam, who is the CRBC Restoration Program Manager, who assists me in the technical aspects of our program tonight. So before we get into it, let's, I'd like to cover a few items. So the Clackamas River Basin Council is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Since its founding in 1996, the CRBC has worked as a non-governmental group of stakeholders to protect and improve the Clackamas River Basin and its tributaries. Their mission is to foster partnerships for clean water and to improve fish and wildlife habitat and the quality of life for all those who live, work, and recreate within our Clackamas River watershed. So on behalf of the Basin Council, I'd like to thank our two gold sponsors, the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative and the Clackamas Water Environment Services. So Liz is gonna put up here, like you see a brief one minute video that describes some of the recycling cooperative uh, services. All right, give me a thumbs up, Dave, if you hear my, if you uh, hear the sound. <laughs> here in Oregon, we have a lot to celebrate. The Oregon Bottle Bill is turning 50. That's a half century of keeping our state clean while recycling billions of containers. A one-of-a-kind legacy that has us all saying cheers to the future. And proof that a small deposit can bring many happy returns. Happy birthday, Bottle Bill! Here in okay. okay, there we go. So, always fun and exciting. So also thank you to our bronze sponsors, Blackness River Water Providers, the Geological Society of the Oregon Country, Port Blakely and Metro. And thanks to the many individuals who continue to donate to support our conference. And we can continue to seek additional donations, which are tax deductible. Good time of the year to do that. By the way, the Clackamas River Basin has been occupied by native peoples for millennia. It's originally the territory of the Clackamas, Chinook, Malala, Kalapuya, and other peoples. It is currently recognized as lands of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron, the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs, and belongs to other native peoples who may not be federally recognized. We thank those who came before us for their stewardship of these lands and waters and those who continue to steward them now and in the future. So we're gathered for this journey down the Clackamas to learn in-depth information about the basin and its connections to Oregon as a whole, to connect with each other so that we can support our mutual efforts to improve the Clackamas River Basin and its tributaries and to have some educational fun. So the CRBC is partnering with the Environmental Learning Center at Clackamas Community College the workshop attendees will receive a science certificate of completion for each session. If you'd like a certificate of completion, please add your contact information to our journey down the Clackamas Conference Networking Google Sheet and indicate that you'd like a certificate in the G column and we'll forward your contact information to the Clackamas Community College. So I'd like to share a few ground rules before I introduce our special guests. So please keep your microphones on mute unless invited to particip participate and you can keep your cameras off if you like. That'll help us save bandwidth for our presenters and greatly reduce the carbon footprint of our meeting. So we'll have two presenters this evening with a brief Q&A after each presentation. So after the first one, you can, we'll open it up for questions. So please type your questions in the chat and we will select questions from there. So feel free to send direct chats to friends that you're seeing in the participants list also if you like. So we'll start our presentation for this evening. So please remember to keep your uh, self on mute and to type your questions on chat in the chat box. And we'll answer those questions at the end of each presentation. So the webinar will extend to about 7.15 tonight with questions afterwards. So let me introduce our two speakers. So Ben Walzak is the supervising fish and wildlife biologist for the North Willamette Watershed District of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, where he reviews, designs, and otherwise retains overview of all activities and issues related to fisheries in this geographic area. Ben has principally been with ODFW since 2001 and received his BS degrees in environmental science and geography from Oregon State University in 2001. Our second speaker for tonight is Doug Kramer, who graduated from Oregon State with a bachelor's degree in both fishery science and wildlife science in 1975 is a certified fishery scientist by the American Fishery Society. Doug worked for Portland General Electric from 1976 to 2013 and was manager of Westside Fish and Aquatics Group from 2007 through 2013. 
So he represents the Oregon chapter of the American Fishery Society on the scientific review panel to determine the threatened and endangered status of Columbia River salmon and steelhead populations. So now let's welcome Ben and Doug as they present about fish hatcheries within the Clackamas River Basin. Take it away, you two. Okay, let's see if we can make this work. Man. Okay, so I have the screen share. All right, Dave, you hear me? Looks like your screen. Yep, there you go. There's a picture of you. It looks like. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Uh, we have the wrong. Uh, the wrong <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That. Can you see the uh, title slide now, Dave? Yep, yeah, looks good. Okay. All right. All right. Go ahead, Doug. I'll click through. Oh, so this is uh, this actually is a early uh, early photo. Of some guys catching some schnook on the lower Columbia, or excuse me, the lower Clackamas, and um, it was said it was a Casadero, but I think we think it's I think it's down lower in the basin. Um, anyway, welcome. Why don't we just go ahead and go to the Next slide. So this is all starting. This is a um, for me was a, a really difficult uh, thing because uh, being a, a fish head, I like to really get down in the in the weeds and, and look at stuff. And I re realize that there's so much information because uh, uh, of the length of time here. And this all started uh, as it says here. Probably no tributary of the Columbia River was abound so profusely as salmon in the past years, and was the Clackamas River. And that was said by uh, Livingston Stone, and he was hired by the Federal uh, U.S. Fish Commission to explore the entire uh, Columbia Basin to look for a place to build the first hatchery. And he came up with the Clackamas. And uh, he spent two years traveling throughout the Columbia Basin, and this is where he came up with. So what happens if you look at this graph, uh, I'm going to see that, that goes from 1866 to 2000 is to catch commercial landings of salmon and steelhead in the Columbia. Um, and I think that the thing is, that actually, the, the spring, the Chinook, the Chinook guys peaked early. They peaked in the, in the 1870s. Um, and then this is for both steelhead and, and, and Chinook. But they've declined dramatically. Uh, and 1975, this is interesting. The, the peak was in, 19, in 1873 which is only eight years after the finish of the, of the Civil War. So by that time, we had already taken this massive uh, salmon uh, fishery and had started to reduce the abundance. And so the idea that they were gonna try to increase the abundance through the hatcheries. So let's go to this timeline. So uh, I'm, this is a complicated slide and hope you, hope you, but this was the best way to show it. Um, if you look kind of down the left-hand corner, uh, you'll see that the different colors are supposed to be to go with the different boxes. Um, uh, some of them kind of, when I talk about hatcheries, are, are really maybe have two or all three species. Um, the black boxes, there are some black boxes, and, and they may have some that have more, more, uh, more species than one, is why they show that. Um, but basically, you can see that... Uh, so the Lower Clackamas operation was the very first one in the, in the country, started in um, 1877, taking eggs down at Clear Creek. Now this, the whole idea is this timeline is trying to provide a context uh, for the extent of the hatchery activities that have occurred across the species in the Clackamas basin. So we're gonna stick, try, try to stick with just the Clackamas. Um, early on, the people didn't recognize very when they first started, they did not really know that fish home back to specific tributaries. They had an idea, but that in the 18, in the 1870s, not really. It wasn't really until probably in the well, 1920s that they really started figuring out that fish actually homed back. And they even then they didn't realize the, how how uh, serious that was uh, as far as hatcheries go. Um, 
Therefore, the fish were often translocated from one system to another. They did that frequently. We still do that some, um, but so they would pick up, they would take a, a, a fish from one area. And you'll notice that some of our fish that we have here, they would trap fish and they traded them early on. They traded fish with different places. So they might send fish to the Great Lakes and they would send us some white fish or they might send them to somewhere in Montana and they would send back some grayling eggs or grayling fish and uh, from my, my reason, and some of those fish actually got released into the Galapagos. But um, so little was known about fish husbandry. In fact, almost nothing was known about fish husbandry in those years. Um, and so we believe a lot, of the, a lot of this type of building the early hatcheries contributed uh, little to the yield of adults and probably uh, uh, aided in the decline a little bit. So I'm gonna start off with Chinook salmon and it's gonna include both fall Chinook and spring Chinook. Although spring Chinook is by far the most prized species because of its flesh quality. Um, as early as 1877, there was a concerted effort to utilize hatcheries in the Columbia Basin. Broodstock was first obtained uh, on the racks. Well, the first ones were at the mouth of Cedar Creek and they were released as fry. In fact, all of the early ones were, were, were pretty much true hatcheries in that they actually just hatched, took the eggs, hatched the fish and let them go. Um, and of course that means you probably didn't get a lot of, of uh, return from them. And it, it's one of those things that we seem to do over and over again. We, we think that by going and intervening, they take fish out of the wild. They took you know thousands of fish out of the wild, hatched them, did the same thing that the fish were gonna do in the wild and then released them um, where they thought they would do the best good. At the same time, they also traded, traded some of those fish away, like I said, to other people. Um, so when we get down to the, I'll see if we go through, is there anything particular here? So hatchery, River Mill hatchery started, spring Dam. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go this little, yeah. So the, the whole takeaway is here that basically fish husbandry is largely based on release of unfed fry from those early years into the, into the clackamas. Variable conditions, uh, probably poor contribution to the adult return. And this likely resulted in a, like a, a, a reduction. Um, you can see that the, early on the racks were down low, which turned out mostly to be fall chinook. And then you can see they did take some they moved away to the upper Clackamas Basin and they had to go by horseback and they put racks across and they, uh, they would collect eggs from several, they would stop the entire run up there for at least a few days, uh, collect several thousand Chinook and take their eggs and bring them back down. Um, Casadero Dam was uh, built, it was the first cross the river dam other than a grist mill dam way down early on below Gladstone that, that stopped fish from time to time. But uh, River Mill Dam was the first major dam up here that, uh, that blocked the entire run. So River Mill Hatchery uh, was where they brought their fish when they caught them up above, brought them back to River Mill Hatchery. And then Eagle Creek Hatchery uh, opened, a, or excuse me, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service opened the Delft Creek Hatchery on Eagle Creek. Now Delft Creek, Delft, Delft Creek is in the, in the upper Eagle Creek Basin. Um, and then uh, in 1939, um, you know, Casadero had, had Dam washed out in 1913. And uh, you know, in 19, excuse me. Well, Passage was restored in 39. Yeah, so Passage, I guess that is, Passage was restored uh, at Casadero Dam um, in 39. So that was good. So continuing on, you can see that uh, the, we started building as we got into the more current times, um, we started building and moving hatcheries around, finding better water supplies, finding better spots to put the hatcheries. 
uh, and learning a little bit more about this husbandry. Um, so we probably we probably started to do uh, a little a better at, at returning fish. Um, from 1942 to 1979, spring snook were primarily obtained in the lower Clackamas downstream of River Mill Dam at Eagle Creek. Uh, passage was restored at Casadero Dam um, after being washed out, the latter being washed out. So passage restored in Casadero Dam in 1939, allowing the recolonization of the upper basin uh, for egg take operations uh, moved to the lower, moved to the lower river. Um, then the releases of Thule stock, Fall Chinook, came into play. Thule stock are kind of a, um, a generalized stock from the lower Columbia, out of, they're out of basin stocks. And those fish were made, I, I'm assuming most of those were, were planted near the mouth of the Clackamas, but Thule stock uh, were brought into the basin in 1951. Um, they're uh, um, really used heavily in the upper Willamette Basin. Um, and uh, they're really not uh, nearly the, the, the food fish that, uh, that uh, spring shook are. Um, when you see here that uh, Delft Creek Hatchery was closed in 1957, uh, and Eagle Creek Hatchery came online with more modern fish cultural tools, and uh, the hatchery started releasing spring shook into the Clackamas in 1985. Um, now, as part of the FERC license, PG funded the construction as we move up this timeline. Uh, the, the PG license, uh, the Clackamas Hatchery was to mitigate. We funded the uh, Clackamas Hatchery to mitigate for dam impacts to the population of Spring Chinook in the, in the Clackamas Basin. Uh, Willamette stock. Spring Chinook were utilized for hatchery production and comprised most of the majority of upstream spawners uh, of North Fork until 2000. So when that dam came online in 1981, it's down at the lower end, kind of in well, it's in mid, mid McIver Park. Uh, many of those fish uh, passed the hatchery, the, the, the stream coming out of there was relatively small and and uh, we had a very difficult time uh, getting fish to go back into the hatchery. So consequently, a lot of them came up and passed over River Mill. In fact, I remember the first year that we were late into the season and the Clackamas was full of spring Chinook holding down there and they weren't going into the hatchery. So uh, the hatchery asked us to hold back as much water. So one night we, dro we dropped the river to its minimum flow that it had been in many years to see if that would uh, cause the fish to go up to the hatchery and it didn't make any difference. Um, but they did start as we finally got closer to spawning, they finally started moving to the hatchery and, and actually the following year did better um, as the hatchery also worked on getting a little bit of increased supply and, and um, working at the configuration of the stream. So um, hatchery were allowed to repopulate um, the upper Clackamas. Uh, and they did a, a pretty good job. Uh, the first couple of years, the fish did not move upstream uh, very far from, from North Fork Dam. So we trucked a lot of the fish um, up to the Big Bottom area. We released fish at the, the mouth of the Kalawash, um, at uh, a Big Bottom, uh, way in the upper season, and also um, off the face of the, the powerhouse at uh, Three Links to kind of spread them out. And we were able to get fish up there because we knew that the, the upper basin up there in the, in the big bottom area on the main fork of the Clackamas is where the predominant cold water uh, area was. And then uh, actually with some changes in the last license, putting more water down the Oak Grove Fork, which was the other cold water system, part of our system, that has uh, substantially moved a lot more spawners. Um, and then, to comply as, as the fish came back and we're getting really pretty good production in the upper basin to comply with the, the uh, wild fish policy, PG excluded mark spring snook because all of the hatchery fish were marked and we were trying to make sure we just passed uh, naturally spawned fish to keep to get that wild, that wild uh, gene going back in there. And so 
we only passed uh, since 2000 have only passed uh, wild spring chinook uh, back over uh, North Fork. Yes, go there. So next, um, talk about a little bit about winter steelhead. Uh, a, a little, a, a much shorter time frame to deal with here as far as the hatcheries go. So. Um, Steelhead hatchery production, unlike salmon production, was basically implement, implemented to improve sport rather than commercial fisheries. Um, the population of wild winter steelhead has, uh, it has hatchery influence since the first releases of hatchery fish occurred in Delft Creek in 1936. Um, like the spring Chinook hatchery programs, out of basin stocks were used for, clack, for hatchery supplementation in lower Clackamas River and Eagle Creek uh, until the wild brood stock program began in 1996. Um, Big Creek stock winters are still spawning naturally in the Clackamas um, uh, at reduced levels, but it's the same thing we do here now. Uh, hatchery fish are marked uh, and released mostly in the lower basin um, and um, now sorted at North Fork, so only the uh, wild fish are going by. And uh, we're hoping to see still uh, big increases in numbers. Um, we get the summer steel in there. No, oh, yeah, oh, we're not switch. summers yet. Okay, let's go in. Yeah, so let's switch to, switch to. Well, I'll go first. Don't you did, okay, we'll do color. We'll come back to the summer, my bad. Um, so, Coho production, uh, egg collection from coho winter steelhead uh, was basically sporadic until 1945, because all of the, up until 1945, almost all the emphasis was put on spring and fall chinook, but really spring chinook. And from time to time, the, the record, when you read the record, it's very complicated. They took fish from one spot, put them in another spot, released them for a couple of years. Then they moved that spot to another spot and they had similar names. Some of them are called Lower Clackamas Hatchery, Clackamas Station, um, and then Upper Clackamas Hatchery was where they took fish above North Fork, and, and then they have Delft Creek Station and, and Eagle Creek Station. So it's, uh, it gets very complicated to follow these, and so we're doing our best to, 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 to iron out exactly what happened with, with all these species, but Co was one that had, a, uh, fortunately, a lesser time span uh, then the Chinook is charged for trying to follow these things. But the Delft Creek hatchery um, released some native co obtained from the lower river uh, in 1947 and 98. But then it was really 1957 to 1974, uh, the co, uh, the early run co from multiple Columbia River hatcheries was released throughout the basin. And those were those released in the form of smolt, pre smolt, fry adults, and they were released in all of just basically all of the basin above North Fork um, for a number of years to try to get this thing started. We started getting pretty good production uh, from those fish right away. Um, so then from 19, also in 1957 through 1990, early run co were released in the lower tributaries downstream of River Mill was also included fry, pre-smolt, smolt, and adult. And the, the primary um, run down there for a lot of people was the coho run that came back uh, to Eagle Creek Hatchery. And, uh, and that provided a, a kind of a sport fishery. The Eagle Creek Hatchery released the, most of their fish there, but they also had other kind of contracts to release fish off station that were or maybe not uh, co from the Clackamas. So uh, we'll talk about the captive brood after that. We did captive brood on the late run from 90, uh, oh, from 86, excuse me. We did five year captive brood. Thank you, Garth. I did five year captive brood uh, from 1986 through 1991. Uh, fish were trapped uh, out of the, out of the uh, trap here at North Fork. Um, 
and they were released. They were released, marked, and released back to to uh, the area above. Excuse me, weren't marked. They were released back. To, turn down, turn down, turn down, turn down, turn down, excuse me, code wire tank. So when they came back, we could wand fish. Uh, so they released uh, 90, 89 through 91, came back, uh, you know, basically from 90 or from 89 through 95. Um, and uh, we followed those fish. They did spawn, uh, go back and spawn successfully. Um, we did look at the problem we had, like we have in many places, we looked at the return rates. That's a little, it's a little um, disconcerting. We looked at the number of fish, the number of uh, fish we had produced from our wild brood stock and the number of smolts that went out. And we also looked at the number of smolts the same for those same years, the number of smolts that went out from our smolt trap that counts all of the co coming out. And in those four years, we looked at the returns uh, and we looked at the survival difference between what were released as wild brood stock and came back versus how many uh, wild coho smolts went out um, that were normally wild spawned and how many of those came out. And there was about a three to five fold um, higher return rate on the non hatchery fish, which kind of points out that sometimes um, in all our our uh, move to do hatcheries to think that we're going to increase the number of fish. Sometimes we may take a few steps back um, uh, and that they don't come back as well as if we would have left the fish out there. So anyhow, we, we discontinued, we discontinued that effort um, after 91. Um, moving on to summer steelhead. So, from 1968 to 1998, summer steelhead um, were released above North Fork. Released about, a, you know, it varied, but it was about 162,000 uh, smolts per year were released. Um, those fish were marked. They were made specifically for uh, uh, a sport fishery. Um, and it was one of probably the most um, successful programs as far as the fishermen concerned. That was an unbelievable return, uh, an unbelievable response from the public. Um, it caused us some problems and that we had people all over our fish facilities all of the time. <laughs> um, at one point, we had a number of, we, we had uh, planted some groups of fish in the, in the North Fork fish ladder. So the smolts would not be subject to the trout fishery because the fish were released before the trout fishery started. And they're big enough to be caught as trout because they were bigger than six inches. So the state thought, well, let's put some in the fish ladder and see how they come back and get them, keep them out of the trout fishery. Well, the problem is when they came back, they came back and they stayed in the fish ladder. And at one point we had, I don't know, between we figure between four and 600 fish sitting in the North Fork fish ladder. It's a two mile long ladder, which led to a significant amount of, of um, poaching. Um, and we had fish shot with arrows and we had fish shot with 22s because the, such a long ladder and people could get up in some kind of areas where they felt safe could do that. So we, um, eventually discontinued that as, as, a, as not being such a great idea, um, which a, a, in one part may have led part of the, the reason to, to switch the uh, trout season to a later opening to protect, uh, uh, protect smolts. And then in 1999, uh, no summer steelhead were allowed to pass North Fork Dam. So now the, the, uh, the, 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 some of the, fishery for the Clackamas is below River Mill Dam. Uh, fish are caught in the trap and cycle back downstream to get up uh, this far. Okay. Um, so trout, going over to trout. Uh, so in the basin, we've had brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, kokanee. Um, we've had some other, we've had some other trout show up that were 
probably released by somebody um, who had a fondness for certain kinds of fish, I guess. But uh, the trout is an extensive program. Um, brook trout uh, were thought to be established from naturally producing populations in the river. But the biggest brook trout population are really um, is, is high lakes. Um, and so uh, they fish were put in the high lakes uh, and then they, they've uh, discontinued stocking fish in lakes that had um, a, a tributary leading back to the river. So we're, we weren't getting uh, brook trout uh, down, but they were, they're the, the brook trout continues to be a healthy fishery in Timothy Lake. Um, and there are brook trout scattered uh, throughout the basin. Um, well, I think we probably get some still annually, at least uh, for those we do still always got some Dan annually in our downstream migrant facility and people can pick, continue to pick them up here and there, but they're in relatively low abundance outside of, of uh, Timothy Lake and other lakes that are, are stocked. Um, brown trout were brought in in the 30s um, and they were stocked in Harriet Lake and Round Lake, which is a Round Lake is a tributary on the upper Colorwash, but uh, uh, it doesn't have a uh, does not have any feedback to the river. Uh, but brown trout took well um, in in Harriet and in the Oak Grove Fork uh, of the Clackamas, and uh, and they're still abundant in a small stretch up there that include uh, both Harriet Lake and Frog Lake and and, and some spawning down. Um, that we have found in different years below um, uh, Frog Lake. Um, but they are also scattered throughout the basin in very low abundance. I have seen brown trout caught uh, by people clear down fishing for salmon at the mouth of the Clackamas and all the way through um, when we still get a few brown trout every year through the downstream um, migrant facility as well as when we were doing studies for relicensing and we're setting trap nets on our reservoirs, uh, we got uh, uh, numerous brown trout, I don't say numerous, but we, we were consistently getting some brown trout, some pretty good sized fish up to five or six pounds in our trap nets. Um, so they don't show up too much in the creel, but every once in a while somebody gets a nice one, but again, most of them are up in the, up in the upper river. Um, Rainbow trout were stocked into the Clackamas River upstream of North Fork starting in 1959. North Fork was basically finished in 58, 59. And that brought forth a huge, uh, another popular fishery that at least lasted for a few months. It was most popular in the spring. Um, and so uh, hatchery fish uh, were planted throughout the base. I'm trying to remember what the numbers are. 300, excuse me. There. So, um, from 1984 through 1991, we had a, a, an average plus or minus of about 181,000 catchable rainbow per year in the Clackamas from Faraday Lake upstream. Uh, also another 5,000 per year were put into Eagle Creek uh, for a, a, a trout fishery in Lower Eagle Creek. Um, and then they discontinued um, Discontinued uh, again in, in terms of trying to rebuild some of the the uh, native uh, native runs. They discontinued uh, trout stocking in the Upper Clackamas um, after 1990 after 1991, but trout are still put into Estacada Lake, um, and we have really no indication that they move up from from uh, that the trout move up from Estacada Lake. But they're currently put in Estacado, Faraday, and in, uh, in um, North Fork, and provide substantial fishery. Um, Kokanee have been stocked in Timothy Lake uh, since about 1960. Well, they were stocked in I shouldn't say they were stocked in 60. I think for two years, three years, they persist. They have a um, they have a, um, uh, a naturally occurring spawning run going up there. We actually tried to reduce that number and, and uh, we're not successful at it. So they're still there. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Let's move on. Uh, so I want to uh, basically uh, thank you guys for the opportunity of doing this. 
uh, article was, this article you're looking at here was an article written in 1907. And even back then they recognized that measure uh, needed to be implemented to save the salmon. And, uh, and I think while the science of harvest management and hatcheries is not static and it's, we're, we're trying to move forward, we certainly have improved harvest and hatchery practices uh, tremendously over the last hundred years. Um, what we have now is certainly vastly improved and, and uh, if nothing else, just being able to mark our, our uh, hatchery fish so that we're able to sort and people know which ones to let go and which ones to keep was a major step. But uh, I appreciate it. Um, I hope this wasn't too rambling. There's a lot of information uh, to cover. And uh, I think that does it for me. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. That was great. Uh, I appreciate it. That was a good wrap up. And uh, so Liz, was there any questions submitted in text chat? You know, I'm not seeing anything come through in the chat. So if anyone does have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll take a little uh, question and answer period right now before the next presentation. Yeah, or secondly, uh, you know, if you think of a question as Ben gets into his presentation, you can certainly save it for, uh, for our last Q&A session after Ben's completed. Uh, yeah, okay, we're still, on, we're still on speaker. If anybody has, if anybody doesn't have any questions, uh, there's so much information. There's this bit, I got charts pages and pages and pages of stuff that I've, I've tried to condense. So if there's any questions, let me I, know. I got a question texted to me. Mm -hmm. What is the change in historical versus current distribution for coho between early and late run? Okay. Well, early run. I assume it means spawning distribution. Spawning distribution. Yeah. What is the change in historical versus current spawning distribution for coho between early and late? Well, we know that there's still late run in the upper Clackamas. We know there's still late run going up Clear Creek. Uh, I don't know about Deep Creek. I think, I think Deep Creek probably more water quality problems than, than other problems. Deep Creek was a um, was a big was a big producer early on. Uh, Eagle Creek, I don't think we have any late run going up Eagle Creek. I, I think that pretty much got fished out of Eagle Creek. So our, I think our late run, I think our late run is, is pretty much um, pretty much in the upper basin. Uh, they don't go clear up into the Clackamas too far because it's too cold for them. Um, but they're pretty much, I think, spread out in all of the all the places they could be. Uh, it depends on run size and how many fish we can I have a couple more questions here. Um, there's a lot of thank yous. Um, thank you for your historical perspective that contributed to naming a feature in the lower Clackamas, Kipling Rock. Uh, do you have any comments about the naming of that? Well, it was fun. It was, uh, yeah, I think it was a good <laughs> great spot. Uh, when, when Rudyard Kipling came and what year was that? Uh, 19... And again, when he came and had a big day of fishing and he was the one who proclaimed that he'd, he'd finally lived and, and he was ready to go into his maker almost, he thought it was a great spot. But I think that was, a, that was an appropriate, that was in the area where they thought that Kipling fished uh, when he came and caught, um, I'm pretty sure that there was, it was in April and he, he caught a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, wild winter steelhead and he, he had a fabulous time. So I think that Kipling Rock naming was very appropriate. That's such an, a great story. Um, there's a question if there are kokanee in the upper Clackamas outside the lake. Yes, um, not many. Every year there was some that made it down, would make it through our, I'm not sure how they're doing now. Uh, we've changed our, we've changed our, uh, our, our uh, operation a little bit. I don't know if we screened them. We don't have a screen on the bottom. So our, um, the fish can make it out if we spill. Fish can come out, and they would be able to get through what we had before. Uh, the valve that we will release water below could could make it out, and there was always some that could make it. And we would find some spawning kokanee um, below uh, Timothy Lake, but not very many. Not very many. Most of them just don't make it. It's a, a huge pressure change to come out, to come out the valve. 
So most of the spawning is above is above Timothy, um, in the tributaries above Timothy, into Timothy. Um, Cheryl McGinnis have a, a question. She mentions your reference to the two mile long fish ladder. And uh, she was wondering if you, uh, you or Garth wanted to talk about the new feature that speeds downriver uh, passage. Well, I can sure yeah, let Garth go it. I can take that one. That's the downstream migrant pipe. It's not the actual adult fish ladder. So it's a seven mile long bypass pipeline where we direct smolts or juveniles in particular, and sometimes kelp steelhead into this bypass pipeline. It starts at North Fork Dam and runs all the way downstream below Rivermill Dam. So it's 7.1 miles long. Uh, our average travel times through there are about three hours uh, for a juvenile fish to move the seven miles. So our survival, our evaluations indicate that survival is near 100% through the bypass pipeline. So whatever we collect at North Fork has an extremely high survival rate throughout that reach versus, you know, naturally going through the river system for those seven miles, or in the other case would be through the hydro complex. So through North Fork, through Faraday, and then over uh, River Mill or through the collection system at River Mill. So uh, very important that we get the highest percentage of smolts and juveniles into that bypass pipeline that we can. Yeah, I would just add it was historically um, for this last license, you know, fish came, fish had were shorted out of, of, out of uh, North Fork and the juveniles went into North Fork fish ladder. And so they had to go the first two miles down the fish ladder. And at that point, we put them into a, a, a pipe that was buried underground um, uh, down, to, down to Estacada. Uh, and every once in a while it got dug up and caused um, fish and water to be <laughs> spread around the streets of Estacada. Um, but it was, it was small, it was slow. Um, we couldn't always tell when it got plugged up because there was no constant thing at the lower end. So this new one is, uh, is a Cadillac of the versions for, and it's just it's working out wonderfully, thank goodness. Amazing engineering, I would say, for sure. Um, one more question for you. Um, is there any evidence, oh, and this is from Devin Patterson. Um, is there any evidence or known history of chum salmon ever being present in the Clackamas? Um, actually, to my best knowledge, I, there's not. Um, in, in chum salmon, chum salmon are, are known for going, um, not going past riffles. They like to, they, they basically spawn and they, they don't like to migrate through high velocity areas. And um, we, we're thinking that probably because you hit high, high gradient flows uh, immediately up the mouth of the Clackamas, it probably, it probably, I mean, there may be some chum salmon that went up there, but it probably prevented chum salmon from really uh, using the Clackamas itself. Uh, there was talk about chum, some chum salmon in a big gravel bar on the, on the Willamette at the mouth of the Clackamas. There was a, a, historically, there was a huge gravel bar that went clear across. The gravel came out of the Clackamas, went clear across the Willamette. Uh, that was mined out years ago, but in that gravel bar, there was talk that there was some chum salmon originally spawning there. All right, well, a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Um, Dave, I'm having a heck of a time getting my mouse cursor to go to my other monitor to stop screen sharing, so I'm going to have to log out and then we'll <laughs> I'm have okay. to turn my computer off and get it to work. So um, we'll let you back in. Off for a second here, okay? unless you can do it manually from your end. Uh, that'd have to be Liz. Can you help them out, Liz? Uh, let's see. For some reason, I cannot get the mouse to go over to the other monitor as try as I might. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, maybe I, maybe okay. I got it. I got it. As soon as you did that, okay. I was able to get to it on there. Okay, uh, good. So I might not. I hopefully you don't. I essentially kicked screen. you out, and then <laughs> so Ben, it should be ready for you to go. Yeah, so go ahead and put your mic on mute there, Garth. And okay, I will do that. All right. Can everyone see what I've got? Yeah, yep. that's great. Works. Thanks, Jim. All right. So I kind of have just a, a 
kind of an overview, my presentation would be an overview of kind of what the role of hatcheries are in the North Willamette Watershed District currently. So um, and kind of how our Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife views hatcheries. So uh, these are different things that we do uh, that are hatchery related in the North Willamette Watershed District. We use um, high tech things like helicopters to, to do high lake stocking all the way down to really low tech stuff like a mule. Um, and this is a like trout program that we do on high lake stocking. So it's one thing that kind of hatcheries do for us in the district. Why is it not? There we go. Sorry, it wasn't uh, putting my slides forward here, advancing them. So one of the main things, uh, because I do work for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to keep in mind is that ODFW, our mission is to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. So that's kind of a mouthful. Um, it's really important. There's a lot in that one sentence. So uh, to me, what this really means is that I have to be in the middle of both um, kind of you're straddling the line, protecting and enhancing. So how do you do that? Because you want people to enjoy it also now and in the future. So you really have to play um, a close attention to what you're doing, when and how, as um, Doug alluded to, hatcheries are really, uh, you, you make changes and they can really affect things in the future. So you really wanna be very conservative in what you do, which kind of leads me to this next slide. This is our uh, 10,000 uh, foot view, if you will, of what a hatchery what our overall hatchery policy is in the state of Oregon. Uh, there's four main goals that our hatchery policy has in it. And it's uh, fostering, you know, number one is to foster and sustain opportunities for sport, commercial and tribal fishers consistent with the con conservation of naturally produced native fish. Um, and as you guys, you can see all the way down through number four is minimize adverse ecological impacts to watersheds caused by hatchery facilities and operations. So we have these four very thought out goals that, that govern all of our hatchery decisions that kind of come out of our mission statement. Um, th that kind of sets the 10,000 10, foot view of what we need to be doing as an agency anytime we're thinking about hatcheries. These are the, this is what we strive to do throughout uh, all hatcheries in the state of Oregon, all programs in the state of Oregon. And um, within that, so what are our management goals then? Those are our policy goals. So the management goals, they are all, they come out of our native fish conservation policy, which is the primary process for planning and coordinating hatchery programs. It's important to realize that a, a hatchery is really a management tool um, that a fish manager has. They're just one of the tools in the toolbox. They are not, um, they shouldn't really be viewed for, through any other lens but that. Um, and that the native fish conservation policy, which is defined in an Oregon administrative rules, really is where those are housed at. And it comes out of that native fish conservation policy. That is where hatcheries are housed in our agency. Um, and when within that, it says that every program, every hatchery program should have a management plan for, uh, for what you're doing. And you need to seek input from appropriate partners like tribal, state, and federal management partners, universities, and the public as well. Um, but you need to use the most up-to-date and reliable scientific information when you're building these plans and vetting these plans. Um, otherwise, you just, you don't get the best po possible product you get. So, and these plans are very detailed. They describe everything from your facility to how you're gonna do your fish culture to your monitoring and evaluation, which you must have to run a hatchery program. So there's several different types of hatchery programs within the state of Oregon and, and all hatcheries, but in our in the state of Oregon, we have harvest programs and their objectives are to operate and um, to en enhance or maintain fisheries without impairing naturally reproducing populations and also to separate hatchery separate hatchery produced and naturally produced native fish and fisheries and on spawning grounds as necessary for conservation and this is the really important piece because this is where 
a lot of the heat with hatcheries really focuses on that bullet alone within harvest programs and some of the objectives. Um, that is where a lot of the uh, research is, a lot of the litigation is, is around that bullet. There's two main types of harvest programs. There's harvest augmentation hatcheries, which are used to increase fishing and harvest opportunities where there is no mitigation in, in place. So that basically means that funding for that does not come from mitigation. It comes from something else like maybe licensed dollars or something like that. And it could be uh, something like, um, you know, uh, a unique opportunity where we want to provide fishing, say, in a high lake or something, and we pay for trout with licensed dollars, raise those trout with licensed dollars, and stock them in a certain situation like a high lake or a, or a different kind of a pond. That is a harvest augmentation. We do it specifically to provide an opportunity for people to fish there. And the funding comes from a, from a different source. A lot of hatcheries, especially ones on the Clackamas, are mitigation hatcheries. And a mitigation hatchery is um, a hatchery that provides fishing and harvest opportunities when there's an agreement in place um, for something that reduces opportunity. The most common example would be a dam, a hydroelectric facility. PGE's, say, North Fork facility, the, is a, it, it allows us to have an agreement with PGE and they provide funds to mitigate for their facility. Other ones would, that you're familiar with in the basin would, or in the area would be like Bonneville Power um, and Bonneville Hatchery and all the programs that run through there for those um, habitat de deterioration, destruction, or, or blockage. So the, but the key thing is there, you have to have the agreement in place and follow the agreement. The other type of hatchery programs and objectives of this, as the two main types are conservation programs. And this is what people, they're much more familiar with the first two, augmentation and mitigation. There's a lot of, and, and those are harvest programs. Uh, they, they forget about this other half of our agency and what we do, which are these conservation programs. And the objectives there are to maintain or increase the number of naturally produced native fish without reducing the productivity or naturally produced fish populations. They try to provide a survival advantage um, with minimal impact. And the important thing with these types of programs is that if you're successful, it's, um, that program goes away. So if, if your conservation is successful and you've mitigated the, uh, or, or fixed the, the causes for the decline, that program goes away. So you've successfully given the, the population a boost it needs while you fix something like say habitat or something. And then, then once that's stable, the fish are back and they're doing fine. That's the goal of these programs. Um, and there's several types of these types of programs. Most people are probably most familiar with the supplementation program, which is where you, where you put a portion of your, your imperiled population through a hatchery to, to gain a temporary survival boost. Um, or you bring in a naturally produced native fish from outside the target river basin to supplement the imperiled local population. Uh, as, as Doug alluded to, that was a common practice um, quite a long time ago. It still does exist. It's kind of more, it's not as prevalent as it used to be as we learn all the things that Doug talked about, but it's still around. Um, restoration programs where you outplant a suitable non-local hatchery produced or naturally produced native fish to establish a population habitat that is currently vacant for that native species using the best available broodstock. We do this on the Clackamas. We've done it um, with our bull trout reintroduction. It's kind of a reach restoration program coupled with an experimental program because you're trying to figure out kind of how how these fish should react in, in an environment um, through a bunch of studies, through using a hatchery. Um, and, and that's the important point too with all these programs is a lot of times they'll be, they're not 100% one and nothing else. They're 80% this, 20% that. And in the very next raceway within a facility, you can have something entirely different. Um, depending on the stocks and what 
what you're raising and, and your, your overall program goals. So uh, captive brood, we use it every once in a while. Uh, captive rearing as well. So there's, there's a, th the point is there's a whole lot of these different things going on that we do use as tools in our toolbox to manage fish and fisheries and um, to not forget about these types of programs. Uh, this is kind of Doug's, Doug's whole presentation and it's really important because this is where hatcheries on the West Coast pretty much started in the Clackamas in this basin. And as Doug showed, there's just a tremendous amount of stuff being done. One of the cool slides on here, I really like this one is, this is the state of Oregon rainbow. It's a fish distribution car. And in the inside are all these milk containers full of fish. They used to run this train from like Chicago and stop all along these small towns and offload fish and people would pull up in their car or horse and go out plant trout to uh, their local lakes. Um, so this started in the early 1900s, like Doug alluded to, and their whole thing was to just get fish out there, uh, all different kinds of stocks of fish. So and not just trout, not just salmon, but bass, you know, warm water fish, channel catfish, shad, uh, kind of anything that someone liked that they could get their hands on would move even down the railways. Um, the current Clackamas hatchery was developed between an, um, as a mitigation agreement between PGE and the state of Oregon in the late 1970s. And at that facility, spring Chinook production began uh, in about 1979 using these adult returns from upper Willamette River stock. I picked to talk about spring Chinook because it's probably the most important stock uh, and has been since the 1870s in the Clackamas River. So, and it's also one of the things we've been working with um, the most recently in the, in, the, in the basin. It's the highest profile thing that we've been doing. So the overall program goal at Clackamas Hatchery currently is to support wild spring Chinook while enhancing commercial and recreational fisheries in Oregon and the Pacific. Um, it's a mitigation, primarily a mitigation um, action. It's a mitigation uh, for PGE's hydroelectric pro project, which blocks a lot of the native spring Chinook spawning and during habitat in the upper Clackamas Basin. And in recent years, we've had uh, really poor returns off of these fish. It's been for a number of uh, management decisions that were made. And it's kind of like a uh, sleuth. You're a sleuth to try and figure out how, what the, what to, to figure out the problem and fix it. So because of the situation, we decided we needed to, we looked at a whole bunch of different actions and including to transitioning this program to an integrated brood stock from the segregated stock, um, which is a, they're entirely different. Segregated stock means it returns at a different timing than your wild fish. Um, and so we're trying to get it and integrate it so it, it all looks the same as a natural origin fish now. And we've, we've done about a decade's worth of research to figure these last two bullets out. And now we're starting to move forward. And what does that movement look like? Well, here's, here's kind of why. We can see in about 2010, this slide shows Hatchery Origin Spring Chinook returning to North Fork collection facility um, in the black line, and then Natural Origin returning to North Fork collection facility in the dotted line. And you could tell we had a problem because I had almost 9,000 adult hatchery spring chinook returning in 2010. And then we have in the low 100 to 150 to 200 fish returning in 2019 and 2020. While at the same time, our natural origin spring chinook are in a generally increasing trend during that time. So we know it's a problem in our hatchery facilities, not in the basin. Um, so we've, we've been aware of it. We've, like I said, we've been working on it and we looked at reintegrating starting in uh, 2020 or so. And the reason this stopped was there was some ongoing litigation. So we had to put a pause on integration. As Doug said, it's, it's really confusing to kind of track what happened when you can't, um, 
you can't even break it down into five year. 20 years is really hard to tell. Five years is even harder to tell because stuff just moves all over the, the board, so to speak, which makes it really difficult to figure out what the problem is going on with everything. Because uh, everyone has their own theories, but it's super hard to figure out. So as I've mentioned, you, if you have a program, you have to have a plan. The plan is called the Hatchery, Genetic, Hatchery and Genetic Management Plan, or HGMP. And that really describes the management of how we're gonna work um, Clackamas Hatchery into an integrated program after these rebuilding years to get the releases back up to where they were. And within this plan, there's also a sliding scale, which really determines the amount of integration depending on the number of wild spring chinook returning to the upper Clackamas River. So uh, after you do your rebuilding, then you're, you're tied to the sliding scale um, to just keep your integration rates and your genetics where they need to be. The basic premise of what's laid out in, in one bullet is hatchery fish will be spawned with hatchery and wild fish will be spawned only with wild. And then the program will be managed with a target of less than 10% of your hatchery origin spawners on natural spawning grounds in the entire Clackamas River. So um, those are the goals in a nutshell and how we would do it. There's, there's a whole lot more behind it than that, but this is the program moving forward will look like this. So what do the rebuilding years look like? Um, the broodstock goal is 600 adult hatchery fish where you get 400 females and 200 males. So it's a two to one spawning matrix, uh, hatchery to male. And research purposes for these first three years is 120 natural origin fish collected from North Fork Dam the next uh, three years. And these fish will be 80 females and 40 males. They'll also be spawned in the two to one man manner. Um, half of these fish will be collected during the month of July, July when most of the adults revive at North Fork. The other half will be collected after that date, but prior to September 15th. The reason for that is after September 15th, you start to get the remnants of those Thule, fit, the Thule stock fall Chinook and you don't wanna mix your stocks. Um, however, if you have less than a thousand wild spring Chinook arriving at North Fork Dam by July 31st, no additional fish, wild fish will be collected for that year. Um, that's just a, you don't wanna to take too many wild fish. And <clears throat> again, going back to our missing statement, it's to protect and enhance. And we wanna do both for, for the future as well. So trying to be conservative on that end. Uh, this is what the sliding scale looks like down here, actually how it is in the HGMP, what we have to follow. So moving forward, so this is years four, five, and six until the next revision to the HGMP goes, this is what the plan would be every year. You'd look at your, <coughs> sorry about that, your natural run size, natural origin run size, uh, your estimate and your count. And you'd say, okay, I fall into this. If I have 1700 fish by July 15th, I know this, and I can take seven males and 14 females, no more than that. If I'm at you know, 2200, I could take up to 45, 15 and 30, no more than that. So um, it just really spells it out really clear on what you're gonna be doing after July 15th, because we have a real, July 15th is when we have a very good guess or estimate on what the strength of the run is going to be. Um, the, and again, ha the hatchery fish will be collected at the hatchery and also up at the North Fork. So if we have some swimbacks. Um, so, and the natural origin fish will really only be collected up at North Fork. So they're kind of, North Fork is really key to the operation um, because you can handle fish there and separate fish without actually touching them, which is um, very important to everything, but you can get a good identification of Finmark up there. So again, like I talked about, the collection and timing is very important with this project. Um, because that sliding scale is really guiding what we do. And we wanna be sure that we don't take too many wild fish. We, we really don't wanna affect that wild 
genetics. Uh, we want to just take what is considered an acceptable risk um, from our genetics professors that we work with at Oregon State University. So uh, that July 15th date is very important given the historical record of passage at North Fork. The um, delayed collection also allows us to look at uh, pre spawn mort it limits pre spawn mortality, mortality because we don't have to hold the fish nearly as long prior to spawning. These fish are going to spawn if you collect them in July 15th. They may not spawn until September 15th to October 15th, maybe as early as Chris or uh, Halloween, so end of end of October. So you have to hold them for three or four months, some or three months or so, in the heat of the summer, with all kinds of um, you know warmer water less water, uh, stressors, just um, they're being held at a very stressful time of year. So the, the, the less you can hold, you have to hold them, the better it is for these fish. Um, so they don't, we don't have pre spawn mortality. Also, because that two to one mating scheme we have to use, it's really important that we have accurate sex determination. And as the fish get a little bit closer to spawning, um, their secondary characteristics are a little bit more advanced. So you can really tell males from females, like the, say for instance, the kite on a male or the larger belly on a female uh, can really help you there. And it also allows us to get much more confident in our estimation of the run size. So uh, we don't kind of stray from that sliding scale which are all very important considerations when trying to figure out how to make this program uh, successful. It's also um, really important to recognize that this is a great opportunity to do both research and monitoring um, of Spring Chinook, not only in our basin, but also hatchery practices, because you want to continue to improve how things go. And, um, so with this project, we're working with uh, Oregon State University um, on a genetic study that'll help us look at this uh, program's kind of, if it's a measure of success, what does successful uh, look like? So to do that, we're using parental based genetic tags. So every uh, natural origin fish spawn will take DNA off of them, catalog them, and then as the adults from those offspring, as those offspring come back as adults, we'll take more genetics off of those fish and then we can compare um, and see what fish are contributing to the hatchery production. Um, so that'll be really starting, we'll start to get that data in you know, 2024 and onward. But um, the important thing is there is that we're doing this uh, highly thought out uh, peer reviewed research project to kind of see performance of a hatchery program as you're refounding a program and learn from it. Um, that's really important to do. Also, uh, coming with this program, like I said, you have to have monitoring and evaluation. It's a good thing because you get all these other research projects kind of coming off of it, but are directly rated uh, that can be not directly related to the Spring Chinook program, but we use that information to evaluate and guide the overall program. So some of the things you'd look at are, um, you know, punch card and electronic reporting, creel surveys and commercial catch. That helps us determine the fishery benefits, not only to the Clackamas, but also to the Willamette, the Columbia and the ocean and um, other nations like Canada, where those fish contribute. You can also look at, Things like um, mortalities to look at pre-spawn stuff, like I said, is very important to see if there's any kind of run timing, adult to jack or fecundity. We wanna make sure all that doesn't differ between the hatchery and natural origin fish returning. So we study both the natural origin fish on spawning ground surveys as well as fish in the hatchery to make sure that everything is kind of the same. Um, but it leads into all kinds of other stuff you can track over time. And, um, the spawning surveys really help us assess habitat as well as um, they help us also with stream protections as we look at things like growth and um, water and all that. It, 
having the data allows us to make much better decisions on fish use uh, for the larger picture on protection of, of the whole, of the basin of the whole. So uh, those kind of things are kind of what a program will get us, what this program, and I, I picked this one to describe to you because it's the most recent program we have going right now uh, in the Clackamas. All right, that's kind of what I've got. That is what I've got. Thanks, Ben, that was excellent. Very, very informative and well explained. Liz, do we have any questions in text chat? Yeah, so um, folks, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in chat or I'll try to keep my eye out on the participant list to see if there's any raised hands. But um, a first question that we have is from Bill Monroe. And he asks um, if you're seeing any straying or interaction between hatchery and wild fish on spawning grounds. Depends on the species and the year. There's different rates that are acceptable. Uh, generally, it's under 5% or 10 to 10%, uh, uh, depending on the species. So, yes, there is some, but generally in the Clackamas or Spring Chinook, Winter steelhead. Um, but those are the two main programs we have. It's under five percent every annually. Coho. It's important to note that the coho program on the clock, the hatchery coho program on the Clackamas, is run by Eagle Creek National Fish Hatchery. So that's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The state has nothing to do with that program. We do some monitoring and see that, but it's an entirely different program than what we have as the state of Oregon. That is, um, oh, uh, another question just rolled in. Um, Devin Patterson asks, when collecting fish on the back end of the run to meet management objectives, do you expect that their offspring will be later returning? Um, I guess by the back end, uh, it's kind of relative because while the fish might hit North Fork a little later, you're also not picking the brightest fish. You're, you're picking darker, more sexually mature fish. So it's, and you're picking fish that are 20 to 30 miles up the basin rather than picking them at the mouth. So it's kind of, you wanna, again, mimic the run timing throughout the run, but uh, July 15th is about 25% passage date, which gives us good enough relative strength that we can start to, to collect fish from. So that would be my answer is we probably are catching a lot of the run, it's just ensuring, uh, you know, we get the bulk of the run and, and follow the, the normal run curve. Yeah, well, thank you. Yep. Okay, well, that's it. Is that yeah. it there, Liz? Yeah, that, that was it. I was gonna say if anyone had any other messages, they could unmute and ask them, but um, otherwise okay. those are the only questions I see in the chat. All right, well, we'll just have a few more announcements before we say goodbye, let folks know what's coming up here. Uh, so our next session will be on December 28th, so three days after Christmas. So hopefully, uh, you know, you'll be uh, reconstituted enough to come and join us. And we'll continue our series focusing on fish and we'll cover the interactions now a little bit more in depth between native and hatchery reared fish. So that'll be very interesting. We'll build upon this uh, talk we just had tonight. So please note that this webinar, this next one coming up on the 28th will be at 2 p.m. and not 6 p.m. So hopefully you'll still be on vacation. You can fit this in during your lunch hour or your afternoon. And so you can use the same Zoom link that you have here for this one. You should be able to get in no problem. And we'll send you a uh, thank you email with these links as well as a link to the recording and more information about getting uh, CEUs from CCC. That's hard to say. So our thanks again to uh, Ben and Doug and Garth for helping shepherd all this through for tonight's wonderful talk. So awesome job to the three of you folks. And we also thank our gold sponsors, the uh, Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative and Clackamas Environment Services. And our bronze sponsors, the Clackamas River Water Providers, Metro, Port Blakely, Geological Society of Oregon Country who are helping us uh, keep this conference free for all participants and with their support. And so every little bit helps. So if you would like to donate something for this Christmas holiday season, we're certainly open for business. 
So thank you for joining us tonight. And please let us know what you thought of tonight's program. And we'll see you two Tuesdays from now on December 28th at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So thank you and happy holidays. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Looking good, Liz. <laughs>